this world we're going to be challenged. Meet with us and do us good for Jesus' sake. Amen. Now, I don't know what you like to talk about. Uh, I can give you a little window into what will happen tomorrow morning when I go along to the kitchen at my office and uh, make my first cup of tea. The discussion always is what to do at the weekend. At the moment, a lot of it is about the weather, because it's quite amazing. Um, and through the day, various conversations will occur. Themes will develop, usually around holidays. As I say, the weather, what you did at the weekend. I tend to always say um, what I did on Saturday, and then on Sunday I did church stuff. And some of the people that I work with uh, know that uh, I'm what they think of as a lay minister. They know that I go to church. I've explained something about the King Centre in Chessington and how it works, and I'm quite happy to talk about that. But I'll tell you something, uh, I hardly ever talk about Jesus. I'll talk about church, uh, that I do church stuff on Sundays, or the usual church stuff, and often I move on to Brexit or what's going to happen in the next Social Housing Act and all that kind of thing. Um, why is it that we find it so hard to talk about the person of the Lord Jesus Christ? And you may say, yes, I go to that little chapel in New Street and it's good and it's very friendly, etc., etc. But how often do we talk about the Lord Jesus? You know, we sing great truths about him. We've just done that. And each week we declare those truths here on Sundays, but then we find them so hard to share. And I think generally there are two reasons for that. First of all, there is within us a lack of confidence. Because we live in a culture where to speak about Jesus Christ, his person, who he is, his work, what he did, is risky because there is a deliberate bias against Jesus Christ. And you only have to read the Christian news feeds or any news feed, the BBC news feed, and you'll pick up those themes where the only people that are not allowed actually to have a voice are those who want to speak about the Lord Jesus Christ. And the established church doesn't help because often, you know, we are made to feel that for those of us who are Christians and love the Lord and love the Bible, it's a bit silly to believe all of the Bible. And there is so much confusion that what we tend to do is to default to preaching the gospel by our lives. They will know that you are Christians by the way you live. That is fine. That is good. That is often how we have to be for a while, but eventually words have to be spoken. Because somebody may say to you, well, why do you live like that? Why are you so patient? Why are you not upset by X, Y or Z? And then you have to give an account of the hope that is within you. Well, there comes a point where really you've got to explain the gospel to someone because no one is ever going to be saved because you're a nice person. Now, this isn't new. Because Luke's gospel was written into a culture like ours. And the reason Luke writes his gospel is that he wants to reassure a man called Theophilus that what he believes about Jesus is true. That's why he wrote the book. Right at the beginning he says, with this in mind... Since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, remember Luke was a scientist, he was a doctor, he was forensic in his attention to detail, I too decided to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things that you have been taught. Luke says, I want you to be so certain of these things that you will act on them. And we can say, well, we believe this and we believe that, but these are truths we've been singing about, that we hear about week by week, that must shape the pattern of our lives. The second reason I think we find it so hard to talk about the Lord Jesus is simply us. And it's what, for a better phrase, I've called self-centred religion. You may say, well, I don't really think that's true, Andrew. That, you know, religion, self no, that, that's not true of me. Really? Well, we need to look at this passage this morning and I think as it's done for me this week it will penetrate our hearts and show us what is really there and I don't come out of this examination very well. So a lack of confidence 
coupled with our constantly putting ourselves at the centre of our religious life are the two reasons we just don't talk about Jesus as we should. So the question for us is this. Do we have a Jesus-centred faith that Theophilus has been taught? Or, and do we believe what Christ has come to do for us to the extent it transforms our lives in every way? Or do we have a self-centred religion that is like the Jewish leaders of Jesus' time, who should have been experts in God's promise. They'd read the Old Testament, they'd read all of the prophecies about Jesus, the Messiah, and there he was, standing before them, fulfilling those prophecies, and they wouldn't have any of it, would they? So first of all, let's see what Jesus is like from this passage. Firstly, Jesus gives freedom. So look at verse 10. On a Sabbath... Jesus was teaching in one of the synagogues and a woman was there who had been crippled by a spirit for 18 years. She was bent over and she could not straighten up at all. Now the Sabbath, Sabbath was the day when the Jews would come together to hear the scriptures taught in the synagogue and discuss them. Now this woman had kept coming week by week despite excruciating pain. No painkillers, no injections, no aid. So much of what I do with one of my time, one of my teams at work, is planning adaptations and aids for disabled people in the new houses we are building. And you might believe, you might not believe, the amount of work that goes on to make sure that every handrail is in its right place, everything is done, uh, level access, wheelchair access doors, enough turning circle in a hallway, for those who perhaps suffer in a similar way to this lady. Now, she had none of that. No painkillers, no adaptations in her home. Crippling pain. And I can't imagine what the pain in that woman's life might have been like. But she still made it to synagogue every week. The Bible says it's a spirit afflicting her. Now, what do we mean? What does that mean? It, it doesn't mean that if you've got a pain today or you've got a cold today, it's God's judgment on you because you said a rude word or you gossiped about your friend last week. There's not that direct connection between something you do and then you suffer for it physically. It's not the way it works at all, but the Bible is clear. The Bible is clear but the reason that there is sickness and suffering in the world is because of a spiritual problem. It's because we are part of a humanity that has wholeheartedly rejected God and God consequently has placed us under a curse because of that. And Jesus has come to deal with that curse. So he has come not just to reverse our relationship with God and restore it but also our relationship with the whole created order that can be restored so that one day when Jesus returns we will enjoy a world where there is no sickness, no suffering, no crippling pain. Now that world isn't here yet, but Jesus is. And that's why these accounts that Gospel writers like Luke, Luke give us are so important because they show what the kingdom is like. And they're trailers, forecasts of what that final kingdom will look like. So look what Jesus does in verse 12. When Jesus saw her, he called her forward and said to her, Woman, you are set free from your infirmity. So simple. It is right that we pray for those who are sick. But here there's no all-night prayer meetings, there's no emotion, there's, there's, there's really just Jesus seeing her in her suffering. Look, notice, she doesn't come to him for kids for healing. Some did, didn't they? Master, if you will, you can make me clean, etc. But no, she, she's, she's not expecting Jesus to call her. In grace, he takes the initiative. In tenderness, he calls her over. In love, he heals her. And he calls her and she comes over. That would have been painful, wouldn't it? What you've got here is the unstoppable power of Jesus Christ. He simply says to her, you are free. And her daily struggle against pain stops. Verse 13, then he puts his hand upon her and immediately she straightened up 
And praise God, you bet she did. The relief, the joy, the freedom, and Jesus is the freedom giver. That's what he does. That's in his job description. He is the one who sees people in their brokenness, in their pain, in their suffering, and he acts to save them. In Luke, he's often called the saviour, but you can equally translate that word as healer. And while Jesus is here on earth, read through the Gospels, he shows us that in his kingdom, all the products of sin are being destroyed. And that includes excruciating pain. And he is the one who has come to set us free from them all, sickness, suffering, evil eventually death and he achieves that how? by going to the cross he's on his way to the cross at the moment he steadfastly set his face towards Jerusalem where religious leaders hated him he was going to his death and he takes the punishment we deserve when he dies on the cross what does he do then to give us our freedom? he frees us from all the shame and the guilt we feel about the past He takes sin upon himself, so he frees us from the slavery of selfishness and unkindness, so the power of his spirit living within us, we can be transformed into people who genuinely love one another. And he frees us from fear about the future, the slavery of anxiety and worry. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. Righteous run to it and they are saved. Because we know we are following a God who has our times in his hands and we know where our times are going to end up. We may have to go to the valley of the shadow but our ultimate destination is not darkness, not separation from God but a perfect new world beyond death which we will enjoy forever with him. There's no one else that can free you and if you're not a Christian here this morning there is no one else that can free you in the way I've described. And if you're a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, then this is the life you were created for. So we mustn't enslave ourselves with guilt from the past, enslave ourselves with selfish desires about me, 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 now in the present, and enslave ourselves with anxiety and fear for the future as God holds the future and he has our best interests at heart. And also, not get chained up by anxiety about our dreams which have nothing to do with the kingdom of God. Oh, how often that's the case. The Lord Jesus has come to set us free. That freedom, knowing that we're loved by God despite who we are today and every day and every day and every day and forever and that's quite a long time. But here's the thing. If we know this freedom a number of us here I know do isn't this what we should long for every single human being we ever meet if this is true if Jesus really is the freedom giver surely we want everyone to know him now this synagogue ruler he is not really very impressed with Jesus setting people free Here's the second thing then we're going to see this morning and that is self-centred religion where we do have to look into the mirror. And the first thing we see about self-centred religion is that it is heartless. Verse 14, indignant because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath the synagogue leader said to the people there are six days for work so come and be healed on those days not on the Sabbath. Now that word indignant is a very strong word it really means a, a, a real anger, he's not just a bit upset this synagogue ruler, he's furious he's livid and it shatters this scene of love and tenderness you imagine it people are excited, this woman that they've seen coming in, crippled bent double for 18 years now stands up, moves fluidly for the first time and this synagogue leader, well he's angry and it's Jesus that he's angry with not that he actually turns and has a quiet word with the Messiah. Oh no, he addresses the whole congregation. It's a bit like me saying to Brother Nige, Nige, well I wouldn't say to him, I'd say to all you people, now look, when you play the organ, you do wear shoes. Alright? It is unacceptable for somebody playing the organ, and I'm not looking at Nige, 
to play the organ and not play shoe, not wear shoes. Now it's not like me taking Nigel away and having a little word about his footwear. Actually, bro, it doesn't matter what you wear playing the organ. But the point is that this synagogue addresses the congregation and has his dig at the Lord of Glory to the side. Now, this woman hasn't even come to be healed. She just comes along in another synagogue meeting like she always has done, expecting to hear the scriptures taught, to listen to the men discussing it. She had no idea when she woke up that morning that she'd be walking home in the way that she walked home. There is not an ounce of compassion in this man. He doesn't care about this woman's agony one little bit. Now this fellow is her pastor. It's like Cadix, just not caring about somebody who is really ill, not caring about Pete, not caring about Sue. Can you imagine that? Of course not. It's totally alien to us. He's seen her suffering more than anyone else. He's been synagogue ruler from time immemorial, 18 years, crippled with pain, doesn't care at all. She's a member of his flock. She's dragged herself along every week to hear him teach the scriptures. But he has, his, he has his head shoved so far up his own interpretation of the law, he's lost sight of the true purpose of the scriptures. He's lost sight of everything the Sabbath was supposed to be for. It's good we're reminded of that, because it was supposed to be the day when God's people remembered how they'd been delivered, freed. It was a freedom day. Freedom from slavery in Egypt. Freedom to live in God's promised land. Freedom to be his people, to know they were loved and cared for. That's what Sabbath was all about. And there's nothing more appropriate than setting someone free on the Sabbath. This man doesn't care about this woman. All he cares about is that she sticks to his religious rules. Rules that he doesn't even keep himself. That's the second thing we notice about self-centered religion. It's hypocritical. Verse 15, the Lord answered him, You hypocrites, doesn't each of you on the Sabbath untie your ox or donkey from the stall and lead it out to give it water? Hypocrite comes from a Greek word for mask. And in an ancient Greek play, you didn't have character actors like, say, uh, I don't know, Tom Hanks or Helen Mirren. You've got a mask that represented your part, comedy, tragedy or whatever you sort of stuck it over your face and you said your lines. A mask. And to be a hypocrite is to hide behind a mask in life. To have one set of behaviours inwardly and another set outwardly. That's hypocrisy. Simple as that. Now this synagogue rule is very keen on rigid Sabbath keeping as long as it doesn't affect him. And the way he'd written the rules meant he could still look after his ox or donkey, but note this, they got treated better than the crippled woman. And in the end, his religion was a matter for him of personal convenience. One set of rules applied to him, one set of rules applied to everybody else. He cared for the donkey more than the disabled, more about his possessions than he cared about the lost. I remember a time when I was younger, I went over to Crawley on a Sunday meet up with some friends, Christian friends, some of them. And uh, in those days, keeping Sunday special was at the height of my agenda. My political agenda was that you didn't do X, Y, Z, and A, B, C on a Sunday. They went into a shop and bought sweets on a Sunday. I made my view on that known. And then, horror of horrors, we were going around somebody's house to actually go swimming on a Sunday. I made my views known about that as well. I was far more concerned about these rules that I thought were right than I were about the people. And Sunday observance, and some of you will remember this, and some of you who have become Christians in recent years won't compute this at all, but it did tend to be the measure of orthodoxy. What you did on a Sunday, you know, that set the pattern for whether you were a, a good Christian or not. Eleanor will tell you stories of her family and what they used to not be able to do on a Sunday. Um, it's amusing. Well, it is and it isn't. Sunday is a lovely day. It's a day for worshipping God. It's a day for us as brothers and sisters to come together to enjoy 
worshipping the Lord, enjoy each other, do each other good, have fellowship. But the fact that we have to go to Sainsbury's after this service because we've run out of new roll, I'm, I'm not sure the Lord's too bothered about that. Um, it's not quite uh, feeding your ox, but you do need loo roll. And there's one or two other things on the list, and we'll just have to call them on the way back. It doesn't matter. And it's fascinating, isn't it, how things change, tests of orthodoxy change, and we can be so concerned about being right that the other person doesn't matter. Back in the day, how I should have seen that opportunity to talk to people about the Lord around the swimming pool on that Sunday. I was just appalled that they were swimming and going into a shop on a Sunday. I was the synagogue ruler all over again. I was only about 19 at the time. We have a Christians at Work group and they're a motley crew and uh, come from all walks of Christian life and uh, you sit there sometimes and you listen to how somebody's had a vision of this and somebody's done that and it will be so easy to be critical and think, well, I can't meet with those people because they're not like me. But then you hear them pray. And you hear them pray in a way that you just are lost or you don't pray. And you, because I have to lead it while the guy that is generally leading it is in China for a year. I just tend to read a scripture and bring us back to the Bible. I don't get involved in complex debates about whether having a vision of this, that and the other is right or wrong because actually we're not there for that. We're there to meet around the Bible. The Bible will do its work. And these are lovely people. When we judge the non-Christians around us and when we judge the Christians around us, we're just like the synagogue ruler. We're heartless. We're hypocritical. Do we care more about our possessions than we do about the lost? Do we worry more about our car breaking down than about the broken lives of our friends and colleagues and our family? Spend more thought time on, on holidays and what we're going to do than the plight of those around us who don't know Christ. We'll move heaven and earth maybe to watch the football or we'll get out into the sunshine, but not to get those we say we love under the sound of the gospel. This is why this passage is so reflective of my heart and every time we care more about these things than we do about people we show we don't really believe that Jesus is the freedom giver what have I spent most thought on emotion and energy on the last six months our pastor Daph was speaking about this kind of thing the other week and he said if I'd spent as much energy on evangelism as fitting the bathroom maybe I'd have brought more people to hear of Christ. Jesus says, you hypocrites, masks, outward behaviours don't match inward behaviours. God gives us a great mission field, we run out of it. We don't love the lost people we work with, we judge them, we ignore them, and we certainly don't tell them about the freedom giver. The last thing we see is that self-centred religion is blind. Look at verse 16. Then should not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has kept bound for 18 long years, be set free on the Sabbath day from what bound her? Look, if you're willing to feed your donkey on a Sunday, shouldn't this woman be given her freedom? She's as much a child of Abraham as you, Jesus says to the synagogue ruler. And notice what Jesus says. He's, he's very, very black and white in the language he uses. Whom Satan has kept bound. Reflecting to what we said about sin and suffering and disease being a result of the fall. And that is what everyone in the world needs. Freedom from Satan. Because in the end, if you're not a follower of Jesus Christ, you are a follower of the devil. Why is that? Well, because Genesis 3, the devil has convinced people of some simple lies. Number one, you can be God in your own life. Number two, life's much better like that. Number three, God doesn't really care that you've made that decision. And people are enslaved to those lies. And those lies are actually the reason we live in the world that we do and the reason people have lives that they do. If you want to run a car properly, you drive it properly, you look after it, you do all the things that you need to do, you make sure your tyre pressures are right, you don't hack the engine, you have it serviced, a simple thing like a mechanical, you've got to run it right and if you don't run it right, it'll break down simple illustration, same with a human life 
you don't run it according to the maker's instructions, it will break down. And I hinted at this earlier, it's something that's been laid on my heart very much this week. The problem is that slavery to Satan is not always visually distressing. At all. I mean, we can see what the matter is with this woman. And I hope if she came in here, someone would welcome her, help her to a seat, make sure she was as comfortable as possible. I'm sure we would, actually. Most people who are slaves to Satan don't look any different to you or me. In fact, sometimes they have all the things that we secretly want for ourselves. We support a charity called Wheels for the World, sends wheelchairs out to uh, parts of the world, world that are very deprived in terms of that kind of aid, that kind of need, medicine, and we see the videos of, of, of lovely people receiving a wheelchair, receiving a Bible, being helped to understand about the Lord Jesus, and the freedom actually they have when they have a wheelchair that they can operate and actually be mobile rather than dragging themselves around on their elbows. That's very visual. You can see Satan at work and all that suffering. You want to see it reversed by the Lord Jesus, but enslaves people, not only like that but with a desire for popularity, for riches for security, for acceptance sometimes people seem to be enjoying freedom far more than we do I mean we're here this morning not out enjoying ourselves this time of year traffic up to Chessington is dire because everyone is going to the Chessington world of adventures and having a great time they're not sitting in church but you see the truth is we will never really rejoice in the freedom that Jesus offers until we see how much people are enslaved without him. And it's only when we take God's word seriously that we see slavery to sin and to Satan is worse than being horribly bent double for 18 years every day of your life. Children can be very brutal when you're teaching them the gospel when they're young. And one of ours used to ask a question about most people that we used to talk about. Do they love Jesus? Well, I'm not sure, but then they're going to hell. We should pray for them. Now, yes, absolutely right. I, I remember there was a fellow I used to work with at Horsham. He had a disability. He was a quiet lad. He used to come talk to me sometimes and uh, used to try to, to help him in his work. Lovely chap. 27, came in one morning and my supervisor was in tears. He died. Oh, he's died. He died last night. Nobody knows why. And it was a long time before anybody worked out why Oli had died. He sat in my office. I'd spoken to him. I might have spoken to him about the weather. I might have spoken to him about this, that, and the other, but I never spoke to him about Jesus. And Oli died. He went. And I had no clue where he was. I'd love to think that in some way the Lord touched his life. And the biggest barrier to me not telling people about Jesus is me. I mean, I can explain the gospel to a degree. God has called me and us, all of us, who love him, to show his unconditional, unchangeable, faithful love to the people we live amongst, people that we love, people that we care about. The problem, look at verse 17 as we finish, when he said this, all his opponents were humiliated, but the people were delighted with all the wonderful things he was doing. Probably the same people that shouted, crucify him a while later on and I'm delighted with all the wonderful things Jesus has done for me but I am heartless I see people but I'm more worried about myself I'm a hypocrite because I get more irritated when people don't do what I think they should do rather than whether they know the Lord Jesus or not most of the time I'm blind to people's spiritual needs I seek my own agenda for my own life this is such a serious matter this is why we dare not say that we are not like the synagogue ruler because I challenge all of us in some ways when we look inside we are like that synagogue ruler. It is a serious matter. I mean, I hear people using expressions like, well, people will suffer lost eternity or an eternity without Christ. It's true, but that's not what the Bible calls it. You won't find lost eternity in the Bible. You'll find hell and you'll find everlasting destruction find a place where there is the constant experience of the wrath of God. So what, what, must, what, was, what must we do? Pray. The first thing the Lord said to his disciples when he looked out and he saw all those that were lost and harassed 
and like sheep without a shepherd, pray that the Lord of the harvest will send labourers out. Pray. Because God works through us, doesn't he? We need to have a deep heart and compassion for the people around us. Ask God for it. Go, because we're commanded to go. Go into all the world and make disciples. That's all of us. It's just me and Steve and Alex. All of us. Because people need to hear about Jesus because without him their deepest needs are not met and they won't be free. And then invite. Nothing beats knowing Jesus, does it? Which means that nothing is worse than not knowing him. And so we must invite others to hear this good news. If you're not very good at explaining it, that doesn't matter. Try and get them here on a Sunday morning. And Calix is doing as usual so that they can hear for themselves. So pray with me this morning we might be freedom givers by making Jesus known. Charles Wesley knew about that in the hymn that he wrote that we're going to finish with. And uh, verse 4 says this, Long my imprisoned spirit lay, fast bound in sin and nature's night, and I diffused a quickening ray, I woke the dungeon flame with light, my chains fell off, my heart was free, I rose, went forth and followed thee. Jesus is the freedom giver. Charles Wesley knew that, and he, he wrote that somewhere between 1707 and 1788. Hasn't changed. It's the same life-changing message as it was when the Lord Jesus was on earth, and Charles Wesley believed it, and when we're hearing it today. Thank you.